Hello, welcome to Tips for Teaching Online with Blackboard. This is the latest in our series on quality online teaching. We also have a series going on on quality online course design that is uh, separate but certainly related. So today, I'm your presenter. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at Northern Illinois University. And I'd like to officially welcome you to the webinar today live, or if you're watching the recording, thank you for finding us and thank you for watching it. So today, I have three main areas that I want to look at. These are uh, a mix of tips for Blackboard and some for Blackboard Collaborate or other web conferencing systems. There are also some suggestions that are uh, very broad suggestions for how you might organize or structure your course in Blackboard down to very minute details on uh, settings that you can set that will make your course easier for you or your students to use. So we'll start by looking at ways that you can be more efficient and productive in your online course. We'll look at ways that you can help support your students more effectively. And then we'll focus on synchronous sessions in, through web conferencing like we're having right now. So first up, ways to boost your efficiency and productivity. First, the, the structure of your course goes a long way to helping you be effective and productive, as well as, honestly, your students being effective and productive. So we recommend that you structure your course thoroughly and consistently throughout the entire course. And the, the most effective and efficient way to do that has been, we have found, to structure your course with the content and your assessments or assignments together. So within, this is an example of a course I taught last fall. Here I have the units, unit folders individually. Here's units eight and seven and six and et cetera follow below. For each of these within that folder, the, uh, there's an introduction to the week. There are uh, the assigned readings for the week, whether that was from their textbook or online materials, as well as the instructions and the links to submit any uh, assessments or activities they needed to do that week, such as discussions or submitting a paper. All of that, by grouping all of that together, it makes certainly you a little more productive because it's easy for you to, to cluster those together instead of constantly skipping all about in your course. But then it's also easier for your students to navigate your course because all of that is, is more consistently placed together. I will point out over here on the menu, I do have underneath units. I have assignments and readings as separate areas. I, I think of this as sort of bonus material um, or a bonus placement. The ideal way for students to navigate my course is by going through these weekly folders or unit folders. However, I have duplicated links by using the course link feature in Blackboard so that students can see all of the assignments together if they would rather do that, or they can see all of the readings together. Again, I'm placing the material within the unit folders, but then using course link as a, a content type in order to simply place another link to the same assignment or the same file elsewhere in the course. This means you don't have to upload things twice, you don't have to duplicate a structure, but you can help your students find things in two places. If you're short for time or, or you find that confusing, I would focus on placing all of the assignments and content for one week together in a folder so that it's easier for students to find. The second tip I have to help you build your course structure efficiently is that you build out a template. So for me, my unit folders all started with a welcome video an overview, which is a short sentence or two about what that unit was going to cover, the objectives, information about the class session, if we had one that week. This was an online course that had some synchronous sessions. And then below that were the readings for the week and the assignments for the week. I built this structure once, and then I duplicated this folder, this unit X folder, in order to create the other folders in my course. That way I wasn't building a new item for the video and a new item for the overview and a new item for objectives. I was editing the structure that was already there. 
It helped me, helped me be consistent without having to refer from one week to another over and over again. Once you've built a folder, you use the drop-down link next to the folder name, either here or in your unit view, and then choose copy from the drop-down menu. Another feature that you might not be aware of, because it was just new last May actually, is the student preview. So if you click this icon at the top of your course, it looks a little bit like an eye, but it's a little like a refresh as well. That can put you into student preview mode. Student preview mode lets you see what students see. So I find it helps you be more efficient and productive because you have the confidence to know that your course is set up the way you want it to be. And by ensuring that everything is in place from the student's view now, you save a lot of time on emails from students later when they can't find it or it's not visible or it's not open. The other benefit to the student preview that is a little bit hidden, it's not very obvious that you can do this, is when you enter student preview mode, you have all of the privileges of a student. When you leave student preview, Blackboard asks you if you want to remove that data or keep the data that you generated when you were a student. If you keep the data, Blackboard essentially creates a new student in your course called your name underscore preview user. And then you have that student in your roster, in the grade center, in the discussion board. So you can actually create this preview student, keep it, and then test out grade center calculations or submit a, an assignment and then test out grading it. So by keeping that data instead of deleting the data, you can gain a lot of more in a, a great deal more insight into your course and how it functions rather than having to wait for students to submit an assignment to then figure out where it is so that you can go grade it. The one downside is if you rely on things like course uh, statistics on the grade center, whatever grade you give this preview user is going to affect the mean uh, mean median mode of your students' grades. It is going to affect things like uh, achievement levels or or goal performance levels. So you can dump that data whenever you need to by going back into preview and when you leave it, just saying, no, remove this data. But as long as you keep the data, it gives you a lot of efficiency on testing out your course from the student view. There's also a number of ways that you can grade more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, in fact, we've offered workshops just on uh, tips for grading effectively outside of Blackboard, how you set up your course and your assignments so that you can grade more efficiently and effectively. But within Blackboard specifically, I have a few tips for you. One is if you're using discussion boards as a graded activity, make sure that you enable grading when you set up those discussion boards. The reason I recommend that is because it does several things all at once that save you a great deal of time. For example, it creates a grade center column for you for that discussion board. It also will give you this graded discussion forum page where it collects all of the student's submissions into a single gradable view. So here, I can grade Louisa Alcott by clicking the grade button, and that would bring up a page with all of her submissions. I can then enter a grade in the sidebar like you would for an assignment or other tool and save that back into the Grade Center. When you turn on grading, in addition to this grading view, it also uh, causes the student submissions to the discussion forum to show up in your usual needs grading workflow in the Grade Center. So instead of going into a discussion board, trying to find all of the students' posts and marking them down on paper or tallying them in another document, you can have Blackboard essentially count up for you how many posts they made and collect them so that you can see them all together and all at once. Quite a, quite a time saver over older uh, methods of trying to grade a discussion activity. Another fabulous tool for grading efficiently and quickly is the interactive rubric tool in Blackboard. If you haven't used rubrics before, I will admit they take a little bit of time to set up because you have to build the rubric itself in Blackboard by filling out your, your rows with your specific, uh, your different criteria. 
your levels of performance across the top. And then, of course, you have to write all of these statements that come here into each of the intersections of performance level and criteria. However, when you have this set up, you can set it up by, by points, by a percentage. You can weight different um, criteria. When you have all of that set up, when you try to grade an assignment or a discussion board, you can open up this rubric and then you grade by clicking on each box that the student, at the level that the student performed. And then you can use the individual feedback here to give feedback for a specific criteria, or you can give feedback on the rubric overall to make some comments about how that student performed. I also have just recently discovered that when you associate a rubric with a column in the grade center, you can grade using a rubric there as well. So if you have students, for example, do a, a presentation or a performance in class, or if you are observing them in a clinical setting, you can grade them from the grade center using a rubric to give them that same level of detailed feedback. Students then can see this rubric after you've graded it. You can make it available so they can see it as they are preparing their, uh, their work, writing their paper, doing their project. If you would like to, I encourage that so that students can know how they're going to be assessed before they even begin. But rubrics overall, I think, will save you a great deal of time on grading uh, because they, it makes it quick and easy to grade. It gives students a great deal of feedback. And as I know Dan has attested on numerous occasions, it cuts down on the amount of email you get after the fact where students are confused or puzzled by the grade that they received because you're giving them so much extensive feedback on the rubric. And then my, I think, last tip, I'm trying to remember how many I put on here. Nope, my second, third to last tip, I have lots of grading tips, is to try out BB Grader for iPad. Right now, it is only available on iPad, but BB Grader is going to be part of a larger suite, a larger app that collects tools for teaching with Blackboard that uh, Blackboard is still currently developing. But we get access to BB Grader here a little bit early in order to test it out and try it out. So BB Grader, the Grader app, essentially will pull up all of the assignments you have in any of your courses and then allows you to grade them from an iPad. I really like this because it's a little bit more portable. I can grade wherever I am, so I don't have to wait to be back at my computer. And then it uses the same um, inline grading interface that you use online. So it's familiar and really easy to get accustomed to. So within BB Grader, if you choose to grade a particular student, you can see their paper. You can add annotations in the side by adding comments, just like you do through the inline grading in Blackboard normally. You can add feedback. You can open a rubric in the Grader app and then save all of that. The difference between grading with BB Grader, though, versus online is when you've graded your assignments through the app, all of the grades are saved until you send the grades to the Grade Center. So here, it's easy for you to grade some of the student work, pause, come back later, grade more student work without the, the early students getting access to their feedback and grades before the later ones do. It can certainly solve some confusion that of students who are wondering where their feedback is. So do just keep that in mind as uh, one option available to you that can make your grading a little bit easier uh, when you're on the go. If you haven't used them before, in fact, you probably have used them before, uh, smart views can also help with your grading. If you have a large class or if you've combined sections of a class, uh, or just simply if you have a lot of columns in your grade center, you can create smart views in order to filter out and only see the, uh, the columns or the students that you want to at any given time. So for example, here, assignments and tests that appear in the, co the control panel when you open grade center are actually smart views. Uh, I believe, Jamal, who just joined, your microphone is on. Please mute yourself, or I'll take away all of the audio from everyone. 
So here at the left, if I clicked on assignments, that would show me all of the students, but only the columns associated to assignments. Uh, that can certainly limit the amount of scrolling that I need to do in the Grade Center. So I appreciate doing that when I have uh, eight discussion boards plus six assignments and you know several quizzes, it can become quite ungainly to scroll through all of the columns in the Grade Center. So when you create a smart view in the Grade Center, you specify which students you want to see, you specify which columns you want to see, and then you can set it also as a favorite. Marking it as a favorite means that it will show up here in your control panel so that it's quick and easy for you to get to. Uh, again, smart views are really useful if you have two cross-listed courses or if you have two sections that you've combined into a master course. You can also create a smart view to only see the students who are in one section or another and then uh, grade them more efficiently and, and more effectively. And now my last uh, tip for being efficient and effective and productive with your grading is to use the grade submission tool. Uh, this is a custom tool we've developed here at NIU. It's not available at other institutions, although you may have something similar in place at your university. So here at NIU, you can use grade submission to take a final calculated grade from your grade center and transfer that into my NIU, which is our ERP system of record. So it's it's PeopleSoft, but we call it my NIU. So here I have a list of grades in one column. The, the caveat, the two things you need is you need a column that has letter grades and that is marked as the external grade column. So my letters here of, of very high performing students, all A's, and this green check mark to indicate that it's external grade. When I go to grade submission, those are the grades then that are pulled in here. When I've reviewed them, on the grade submission page and I and click submit, those will be transferred to my NIU where our faculty here at NIU can log in, review those grades one last time and post those as official grades. It means that you don't have to click all of the drop down menus in my NIU to select grades for students when you already have those grades calculated in Blackboard. So from here, it, it becomes a very quick transition from Blackboard to my NIU as opposed to a manual process of entering them. If you haven't used the um, grade submission tool before, I highly encourage you to try it out this at the end of this semester. I'm going to pause for just a moment. If anyone else has any tips for being efficient, productive, working quickly in Blackboard, uh, go ahead and, and put those into the text chat now while I take a moment. Well, I don't see any yet. Feel free to, if something comes up, feel free to type that into the text chat at any time. I welcome interruptions there. And feel free as well to use the text chat to ask questions at any time. I'm happy to answer those as we go. So our next step then is to look at some tips on how to support your students through Blackboard. And of course, we all want to, to do what's best by our students, but the reality is when you have a large number of students to work with every semester and when you're working online where your students aren't there in front of you, it can be challenging to connect to students to help them feel connected to you and for them to know that you are there to support them and, and help them be successful. So we have several tips here for supporting your students and helping them be effective. For um, example, to help your students use your course, it helps them to know where to go and how to get started. So we're recommending as a best practice that you create some sort of a getting started or start here. I called mine welcome start here as a content area for the course entry point in your course. By default at NIU, when you request a new Blackboard course, we set it up so that the home page is the default course entry point. And we do that because the home page has 
some really helpful modules that automatically populate information based on other things you do in your course. However, it's not necessarily, uh, it's really not the most welcoming way for students to come in and see what's going on in your course. So by creating a new content area, calling it welcome or get started, it's a clear, easy way for students to come into the course and know where to go. My welcome page here has a course banner. This is just a, a, a picture file, it's a JPEG. I actually created it from a PowerPoint slide so that this is the same template that I use in my course for any PowerPoint that I use as well. Uh, below that, I have a great deal of information about the course, the description, the objectives, uh, when, we were, when we were meeting online, or in this case, I had some students who were meeting face-to-face. -face. Uh, there's information on how to contact me, how to contact the department, and a short checklist of the first time, the first week or two that they're in the course, what they should do to get started. Excuse me here. <coughs> That getting started checklist included things like read the syllabus, introduce yourself on the discussion board, um, the first reading that I had assigned to them, and the first assignment that they needed to get started on. So I gave them all of that information in a, a quick, easy to use checklist right up front so that they could come in, get started, and know where to go. Uh, I also embed on this page a short video that I create a screencast of my course that explains where they should go for different types of files, where, how to find assignments, um, so that when they come into Blackboard for as an online student, they feel welcome and kind of oriented to the space, and they know they know who I am, they know where to go, and right on the front page, they can meet me and they can hear my voice. If any of you have done something similar with a, a course overview or a screen, screencast to demonstrate your course, uh, please tell us about it in the text chat. My, my second tip for helping students use your course and really knowing what to do and where to go is to set due dates on assessments. Essentially, anything that you set as being graded, you can set a due date on. So this can work on assignments, tests, it can be put on discussion boards, blogs, wikis. Um, you can actually even put a due date on a grade center column, although that gets a little confusing because whether or not students have completed the, the assignment then depends on when you graded it. So if you're a little bit behind, it'll look to students like they have an overdue assignment. But here, this is an, a Blackboard assignment. So here's the due date that is assigned to them. It shows up when they click on the assignment, but it also shows up when they click on, uh, when they go to the calendar for the course. So if they go to Blackboard where they can see all of the dates from all of their courses, the due dates from your assessments will show up there. Students will also see those due dates on the homepage that, with the to-do modules that aggregate information from lots of different areas. And they can see notifications for that on the mobile app and in the global navigation menu on Blackboard. So just by setting this due date, it shows up in several different areas of Blackboard. I actually just recalled one that I forgot to mention because the due date also is displayed in my grades. So if students are checking their grades to see where they stand. They can also see what the due dates are for upcoming assessments still. So one little click when you're setting up an assignment, but it has far-reaching effects on your students. Um, this is a very small tip, I think, but it, again, can have a very big impact. And that is when you're structuring your course, we recommend putting folders in reverse order, meaning instead of starting at the beginning of the course at the top and then going through them in sequential order, we actually recommend putting the first week at the bottom and then putting later weeks above that. The reason for that is when students come in to find content then, the most relevant content is always right at the top. So when they come into your course and they go to your, your units or content or whatever you're calling this area on your menu, they go straight to 
this page of, they, they go straight to the folder they need first. That helps them find it instead of scrolling forever through long, long lists of, of files or folders. Uh, if you're building your course as you're teaching, then your folders are going to always be created at the bottom and you'll have to drag them up to the top of the list. Just do keep that in mind. But it's a fairly easy swap to make so that students can find content more quickly. It's great for you too, honestly, because you're not always scrolling to the bottom yourself when you're posting files or creating new, uh, new materials. And then I also think it helps quite a, quite a bit for you to record welcoming or, or introductory videos for each week or each unit. So here, this is the first item that I place in my course. When I create a folder for each week, I put the this video up at the top in order to explain to students what this week is going to be about. Um, and it's, it's usually short. This one happens to be four minutes. I would say that's pretty average for how long I make them. Although shorter is always better. I wouldn't go over four to five minutes. And if you can make them, if you can get it down to a minute or two, all the better. This video essentially just introduces generally what we're talking about or what they're learning about that week. I can use it ahead of time if I know that there's potential confusion with the topic. I can also use it to remind students about assignments that are coming up. This week you'll be working on, you'll, you'll have this reading and I want you to take the information from that reading, use that when you reply to discussion four, and don't forget that you should start working on your next part of your assignment because that is due next week. Uh, by giving them those reminders, I'm helping them understand how the course is structured. I'm supporting their learning so that they can be successful in my course. I'm creating presence for myself so that they feel like I am part of this course and that I'm a real person who's there to help them. And I'm creating continuity. It's the same thing you do in a face-to-face -face course, but online we have a tendency to forget about that. So these videos, I actually, I record with my cell phone, with my smartphone. Uh, the video on these are really good anymore. I happen to uh, use a tripod or find something nearby that I can balance it on. Um, like here, I'm putting on top of my monitor. That's where I did a lot of them for a while. Sometimes I have actually just held it selfie style. It takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, but I do own a selfie stick for this exact purpose so that I can take videos of myself. Um, once I've recorded it, I upload them to YouTube where I keep them unlisted. So they're just visible to me and to anyone who I give that link to. And then I can use that to embed them within my course so that students can see them, but I don't become a viral star on YouTube for introducing unit eight. <laughs> Um, not that anyone would be particularly interested in it, but I can maintain some privacy while at the same time helping my students get access to the course and understand how the course is progressing. I also, quite honestly, because I'm using videos and I want to make sure my course is still accessible to all students, in YouTube, I use their transcribing tools. Their auto-transcribing is terrible but you can have, it's getting better. And you can either use their initial captions and edit those to make your own, or because these are really short videos, I usually go into their, their tran live transcription tools and just quickly type the, the captions as the video plays. For a four minute video, it probably takes me seven or eight minutes. And then I can uh, save that content out as well as a, a transcript so that students can read the content of the video, they can listen to the video, they can listen, they can watch me with the captions as well. There are a lot of different options for um, how they consume that content then. And I can make sure that my course remains completely accessible to students despite using more advanced media like that. I have recorded most of these videos, by the way, here in my office. You might notice the background behind me is rather similar to the background of that video. 
but I have recorded them on location as well. So when I've been at conferences, I've recorded them from the conference venue or uh, I've recorded them on vacation to give students a sense of where I am and what I'm doing. And I'm usually recording them just a day or two before the next unit opens so that they really are current and relevant as opposed to recording them in advance and kind of canning that um, those messages. In an online course, it's also important that you build community. There's a lot of research on face-to-face -face courses to show that the students who are retained at a university are usually retained because they feel one of the most important factors is feeling connected to the university in some way. That might be being connected to other students, it might be being connected to a faculty member, or connected to someone who uh, they work with in a particular office or with a student organization. In an online course, that sense of community is even more important because students can't just walk into your office and talk to you. They can't bump into their friends, their, their school friends on the street. One of the ways that you can build that sense of community is by making sure that you call students by the name they want to be called. And that can be tricky sometimes because students have... Um, a strong sense of self, and that strong sense of self is not always, in fact, quite often not tied to their legal official names, which are, of course, the ones that are used throughout Blackboard. So in my, uh, at the beginning of my course, I usually have an introduction forum where students go in to share something about themselves. One of the things I ask them to do is tell us what they want to be called. So if your name if, you're, if what you want to be called is not your official name, then tell me and I can use that the rest of the semester. But it's hard to keep track when you have a lot of students. So one way to do that is to create another column in the Grade Center and use that to enter the student's preferred name. So you can see here, I made all of these up because these are our guest accounts. <laughs> but I decided Louisa Alcott, maybe she goes by Lou for short. Or Julius Caesar wants to play it down. He's just a real person like everyone else, so he goes by Joe. Uh, but by keeping these here, when I'm sending students an email, I can refer to this column when I'm titling my email to them. So instead of, Dear Louisa, I can say, Dear Lou, and make her feel like I really know her. Uh, to do this, I created a column just using Create Column here. The, from a technical perspective, you want the primary display to be text because when you the primary display of text lets you type in anything and Blackboard will display that in the Grade Center. And then because I wanted this to be my secret, uh, I hid this column from students' view. So students can't see that I've kept a column with their preferred name, uh, but I can see it when I go to the Grade Center. So. Uh, if that's something that you'd like to try, I highly recommend it. And it's it's fairly easy to pull off from a technical perspective. You may not be using this either because again, this was brand new last, uh, last May when we did our upgrade. Uh, if you haven't set up your Blackboard profile, we highly recommend it. This uses a... Um, a really is sort of a third party tool, but is embedded in Blackboard. And you can set up a profile with your picture, your name. Uh, here I have a small statement about myself. And then I've also built out a, a profile with some cards about my, my experience. I have my Facebook and Twitter pages so people can connect with me there. That's completely optional, by the way. If you don't use those, you don't have to include anything about social media. Uh, I'm an alumnus of NIU. I included a few skills. This is designed for students who are trying to um, pursue an internship or get a job after they graduate. And you can build this out with, with who you are and what types of information you want to share with students. The benefit is within Blackboard then, in the discussion board, your photo will show up anywhere that, any on any post that you make.
if you encourage your students to build out their profiles as well, they'll be able to see each other on the discussion board too. And I think it creates, again, that stronger sense of community when you know who, you know more about who people are based on what they look like and what they've chosen to share with you. So again, this is optional. You get to this page, by the way, if you open the global navigation menu, that's the small gray bar at the very top of Blackboard that has your name right next to where you log out. If you click that, that opens up a long navigation menu that has these icons that are visible here at the left of my screen. And you click on your, at the top, there'll be a, a silhouette. It won't be your photo if you haven't put in a photo yet. But you can click that silhouette and that will take you to a page where you can set up your profile. Your profile, by the way, can be kept private to only us at NIU, or you can make it public to other institutions who are using Blackboard and using these social tools. So then you can start building some camaraderie and, um, and networks across the universities. I will say that feature is not as widely used but at the very least, building your own profile and encouraging students to build their as theirs as well will help to create more of a sense of presence within your Blackboard courses. From uh, a student support perspective, one of the things I hear quite often from faculty, and I've experienced myself, is that the amount of email you receive from students can sometimes be overwhelming particularly in an online environment where that's the primary means that students have for contacting you. So one way to help you manage student email is to set up a, a Q&A, a question and answer, or help forum on your discussion board. So here's an example of mine. I just ask them to post general questions that they have, anything that they would have considered raising their hand to ask in class. This way, if uh, more than one student has the same question, I can answer it once, and then they can all see that answer and not have to ask again. Plus, in uh, at times, you can get students to participate with one another here, where if one student has a question, someone else can answer that, perhaps before you even get to the discussion board. So as you see, I suggest asking questions about course materials, assignments, or if they've had some technical issues. For specific questions around something that's affecting them personally, such as their grade or reasons why, um, perhaps something in their life that is getting in the way of completing the course, those sorts of personal private matters, I do still encourage them to email me with directly. But more public questions that affect the course at large, they can post here for everyone to see. And then at the beginning of the semester, when students contact me with questions that really should belong here, I give them that gentle nudge to say, you know, great question, I'm glad you asked it, but could you post that to our help forum and I'll answer it there. Or uh, in some cases, I, I will post the question for them and then just email back to let them know that I've posted the question and an answer to this forum to go look for the answer there. You can enable anonymous posts on this forum if you wanted to, so that students could ask questions without feeling um, the pressure of identifying themselves as someone who has a question. That way they could post a question anonymously and you can respond then publicly. Uh, that's an option though, it's optional for you to enable it, and it would be optional for students to use it even once you've enabled it. When you do create discussion forums, uh, I find that it's fairly helpful to subscribe to those forums yourself because that way you do get an email notification that there's a, f a new post being made. This is particularly useful on the help forum this, in fact, is my help forum that I ha normally have subscribed to. So when a student makes a new post, I get an email that there's a post there. Um, you may think that the whole point of having this forum is to cut down on email, so why do you want to receive email? And for me, it's because then I get the notification, I set a mental reminder or add it to a checklist to be sure to go in and look, but I'm not constantly checking Blackboard to see if there's a new post on my help forum. 
I, I can get that notification. I can mentally tell myself, yes, it's there. And then I can go answer it when uh, I'm prepared to. But it does still cut down then on the number of students who email you with the same question because the question and the answer can be posted publicly. I also encourage students to subscribe to forums so that they get those same updates, particularly when there's uh, when I have students act as discussion leaders. I like those leaders to subscribe so that they can stay up to date on what's going on in those forums. It's easy otherwise to just take a break and, and check out for two days. And in those two days, a lot can go on that you'll have missed. The subscription, by the way, is a setting that you set up when you create a forum or you can edit a forum to enable subscriptions. Once you've enabled subscriptions, that creates the subscribe button, but then you or your students need to actually click that button in order to be subscribed. So it's really two steps. One step is to enable the ability to subscribe when you set up a forum. And then the second step is to click the subscribe button when you're for those forums that you want to receive notifications on. And then a small change, but remarkably one of those that has a really big impact is when you set an announcement, uh, I recommend clicking the checkbox so that this announcement is sent via email immediately. When you create an announcement, students are automatically notified unless they've turned off their subscription, their notification settings which students can do individually. So they'll get an email announce, an email notification that there is a new announcement. However, when you, when, if you don't check this, what students get is a notification that there's a new announcement. It comes from no reply at um, NIU, no reply blackboard at niu.edu or something like that. It's, it's a generic email box. So it's easy for them to overlook it. It's easy for them to be marked as junk mail because it's coming from this automated sender. Whereas if you click send a copy of this announcement immediately, that email comes from your personal email address then. So I find for students, it has a greater impact when they know that the email is coming from you. It's not this generic, there's something new in the system. This is, I, your instructor, am sending you an announcement. That announcement is still stored in Blackboard, so it becomes part of the record of the course, but students get that then immediately via email. Again, I, it's, it's one little checkbox, but it makes a world of difference to me whether the email comes from me or it comes from the system. And then when it does come from you, if students reply to that announcement, it comes back to you. Whereas if you don't check the checkbox and students reply to the email, it goes back to this unwatched email inbox, in which case they just get an automated reply that says, no one checks this mail, you need to contact your instructor directly. So again, from a, a managing correspondence and trying to support your students, I think uh, that little checkbox makes a big difference. And then lastly, one of the, the, again, small changes you can make that can cut down a great deal on the amount of email you get from students is if you assign a test, we recommend that you do not use force completion. So these are the settings when you're, the test options, when you're deploying a test and you have this option to force completion. What that does is once students start the test in Blackboard, they have to complete it entirely and submit. If they leave the test for any reason, Blackboard will not let them continue taking the test. Uh, it was designed as a, an anti-plagiarism mechanism so that students wouldn't leave the test, come in, see the questions, leave the test, and then come back once they've looked them up to answer them. Uh, and it sounds great in theory, in, in reality, what happens more often is that students are taking the test, their browser crashes, their computer crashes, they lose internet connection. There are a variety of legitimate technical reasons why students are kicked out of a test. When that happens, then you get an email. My computer crashed, now I can't get back in. Could you reset my test for me? 
So then it becomes a matter of policy, whether or not you do that. It becomes a matter of, of as I said, a flood of emails, depending on the size of your course, trying to get this test reset. Whereas instead, if you rely more on the timer, then you can allow students to close the browser and open it up again, but limit them to a certain length of time to complete the test. So for example, if you set a timer here, this is a short quiz. So I just set a timer for 10 minutes. That means from the time the test begins, students only have 10 minutes to complete the test. Once they've clicked begin, they can close the browser, they can walk away and then come back later, and the timer will have expired. If they close the browser, the timer continues counting. So a technical issue actually just eats into the amount of time that they were allotted, as opposed to giving them any advantage of looking up answers and coming back later. Uh, in fact, on the timer, I have it off right now, but you can also set auto submit to be on. When you set that to be on, then students cannot continue past the end of the timer. Blackboard will automatically submit their test when the timer expires. What students will see is a pop-up window that says the timer has expired. Click OK to submit the test. At that point, they cannot continue any further. All of the answers that they've entered are saved and submitted and graded. Uh, and then you can go back and see how far they got on that exam. Uh, I personally think, and we as a department are recommending, that you do not use forced completion and that instead you use a timer with auto submit on if you want students to be limited strictly to that time limit. If you leave the auto submit off, students will receive a notification that the timer has expired, but they are able to continue. Uh, and then when you look at the test, it will have an exclamation mark for needs grading so that you can assess how long they took and what you want to do with that, with that grade. If they took an extra one minute, then maybe they were just quickly checking, selecting answers like they would in person where they just quickly fill in all of the bubbles on the Scantron sheet. But it's up to you to decide what you would do then with a student who went over the timer. Uh, but if you turn it on, they are stopped and they cannot continue. So then the last section that I wanted to cover today are some tips for improving synchronous sessions, web conferencing sessions like what we're having today. These are one of the most effective means of uh, establishing presence and connecting to students because you are connecting in real time. Of course, for an online course, sometimes you prefer to not hold sessions like this because this uh, decreases the amount of flexibility that students have in taking an online course because they can't complete it whenever they want. They have specific times that they need to meet with you. That being said, here are some tips for improving a session if you hold one. When you're preparing for your session, here this is, I know this is a weird like session inside of session for those of you who are alive. Uh, my first recommendation is to keep your slides simple. Uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra in particular does not uh, preserve things like animations or slide transitions. So having one element on a slide at a time and keeping those simple for students to focus on is really helpful. Uh, that's easier than a long list of text for them to read. And anything that you do that's too fancy, such as, as I said, animations, embedded videos, um, some uh, image effects like shadows or um, gradients, transparencies, don't translate well in the online environment. So keep those slides simple. The second recommendation I have is test your equipment and I'm gonna call this Chicago style for those of you who are local uh, early and often that's what we say about Chicago voting in voting in Chicago you vote early and vote often so here this is testing early and often Chicago style make sure that your microphone that your camera uh, work and test it not just once test it a couple of times to make sure that your setting is going to work well. Um, 
Test it the morning before your session starts to make sure that the technology is all up and running while you still have time to fix something if it's not going the way you want it to. Uh, test your slides as well. Load your slides in, click through them to make sure that they're displaying the way that you want them to. In addition to testing early and often yourself, I recommend giving students a chance to test their equipment as well. This might mean uh, if you have a session that starts at a certain time, joining the session an hour early so students can come in and test their setup to make sure they're ready to go. Or it might mean holding some sessions ahead of time, uh, maybe a day or two ahead, just for the purpose of having students come in and test their equipment. I've also hold, done this at the beginning, as I said, of a session by asking students one by one, if I wanted them all to have microphones and talking, turn on your microphone, say hello, and just go down the list in order so that they can all say hello and make sure that their equipment is working. Uh, a few other things you can do to prepare for a session. Uh, be aware of what's behind you here. Make sure that what's behind you is, is fairly attractive and fairly clean. I don't have many options here in my office, but I do at least try to make sure that what's behind me is neat and orderly when I'm having a session like this. And then avoid any strong backlighting. So actually right over here is a window behind me. You'll notice that uh, the blinds are closed, the curtains are closed, to try to mute that light. Webcams are, are very sensitive to light, so strong lights behind you will actually overwhelm the camera sensor and it won't pick up you well at all. To that same uh, token, I suggest simple colors, uh, simple patterns on your clothing, kind of like dressing like a newscaster. Newscasters tend to be in solid colors and bold contrast to show up on camera. So today my purple, even though it's only a little bit of my shoulders showing, uh, my, my purple is a good strong color to show up on camera, where something with a tiny pattern or with a very intricate pattern is just going to overwhelm the camera and become a blur. And then uh, the final preparation step before you actually start the session is we find that it's, it's helpful to send an email just before the session begins. In my course, the, the link to join the session is in like six different places. So if you log into Blackboard, it's easy to find that link. But if you're not going to log in, um, I can at least send a reminder email. And when you get your email, you can click the link in the email to join the session directly. So it's the, the most convenient way for your students to be able to join the session. When you're in the session, uh, things you can do in really any web conferencing system is to greet students as they enter the session. Say hello, greet them by name, and as you're doing that, have some casual chit chat going. Um, there's nothing worse than just coming in and sitting in a dead room. You wouldn't really do that, or at least most people don't do that in a face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, students certainly are talking to each other, if not to you. And so encouraging that in a, a synchronous session, in a web conferencing session, gives students that sense of presence in an online course. When you are presenting via webcam, make sure you smile so that students can uh, see that you are pleasant. And then it also, of course, changes your voice cadence as well. So smiling puts more energy into your voice and makes you sound more engaging rather than being a drone who's not really smiling and who sounds kind of boring. When you're new to web conferencing, if you can, assign someone else to monitor the text chat. Uh, it can be very distracting to see that popping up and trying to keep your train of thought so you can keep talking while you're watching the text chat scroll by can be very overwhelming. If you have a teaching assistant who can monitor the text chat, that's great. Otherwise, uh, try to assign a student or two who are responsible for keeping track on the text chat and then interrupting you if there's something that's really pressing. Or uh, when you have a chance to break, someone who can moderate some questions for you and you can stop and say, okay, well, have there been any questions in the chat? And maybe those students who are monitoring it for you can bring those to your attention. If you don't have that luxury, another option is provide breaks throughout your presentation so that you can check the, the chat periodically. Um, those might be 
section headers or just a, a blank slide that says, um, you know, break, check the, so you can stop, scroll through and read what's come up in the text chat and provide a summary or answer any questions. But giving you those reminders to stop and giving you at the end, when you do that at the end of sections or the end of thoughts, it creates more of a, a flow to the presentation. Of course, synchronous sessions, web conferencing sessions don't have to be lectures. They don't have to be talking all of the time like I'm doing today, admittedly. Um, they can be an opportunity for students to talk to one another, uh, in which case having, you can then maybe monitor the chat while students are talking, or if a student is giving a presentation, you can monitor the chat for them and be the one to moderate a Q&A session at the end of their presentation. Um, it's a great way when you're using a session like this for more student directed activity for you to be still uh, involved in the process and to help them be successful so that they aren't watching six dozen things whiz by them all together. Of course, there are plenty of really specific tips that I could get into on uh, using Collaborate Ultra, how to set the settings, and etc. But I think that's really sort of out of scope for a session on tips for teaching online. And I would encourage you to, to look into some training on using Collaborate Ultra or whatever web conferencing you to, tool you use specifically. I want to close with a few, I'm calling them oddball tips. They didn't really fit into my overall structure. The first one is in Blackboard, you can hide old courses. So if you have a lot of courses in your My Courses module when you log in, you can click on this gear icon in the upper right. You have to have your mouse over My Courses for that icon to be visible. But when it is, you can click that. That lets you turn off the visibility of older courses. It can also uh, let you turn on grouping them by term. So here I can actually open and close these different semesters so that I only see the courses that are in my current semester. And it helps, again, helps me find my courses more efficiently. If you're creating links using the text box editor, for example, if you are posting a link in an announcement or on the discussion forum, Blackboard does not automatically convert those into clickable links. You have to do that manually. So when you create a link, highlight the text like I have here, and then click this chain icon to create the link. When you create a link, I also recommend that you do that so it opens in a new window. That way students click the link, it takes them out of Blackboard to a new tab or to a new browser window where they can review the material and then get back to the announcement or the discussion board post in Blackboard. Again, a small tip, something for you to do and something for you to let your students know that they should do. And then my last tip is to collapse the left navigation when you're working in the Grade Center or working on your content, if you're really focusing on building your course. When you move your mouse over uh, this gray bar between the, the menu and your, your content, you get a long bar that you can click to collapse all of that down and that spreads out the rest of what you have. In the Grade Center, it gives you two or three more grade columns, so you don't have to scroll as much in the Grade Center, <clears throat> and it gives you more uh, visibility when you're creating files or building out material in Blackboard. So if you have any additional tips, please do share those in the text chat. I, I would love to see what tips you have for teaching online in Blackboard. But for right now, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me personally at my email or on Twitter. Or if you're interested in connecting on uh, online teaching in general here at NIU, you can connect with the Online Program Development and Support Office at NIU OPDS on either Twitter or Facebook. But again, I want to thank all of you for joining today. And if you have any questions, those of you who are live, please feel free to post those in the text chat and I'll stick around. Thank you.